So we're talking about composting, which brings us really on to soils. And the soils are one of those, um, I was going to say, unrecognised things about our lives, our own world, that we just take for granted. Because they kind of they're down there and we never really look and we just assume they're all okay. Um, and some of you are old enough to remember Gardner's question time where one of the pundits used to say, Oh, I think the answer lies in the soil. <laughs> and it does. And the other famous one was get in there with the boot. <laughs> and that's part of the mantra for, for successful gardening, I suppose. If we wind back slightly, the soils of the world are in a desperate state. As we came in this, well, this lunchtime, I met one of my former PhD students who's now uh, a refugee from Libya. We introduced Libya to democracy. It's great, they have now had a very unpleasant civil war. Uh, but one of the things we were looking at there was uh, we did quite a lot of work with the Libyans was trying to help the spread of the Sahara. Because the Sahara, as we see it and imagine it today, um, was the breadbasket of their own empire. It was the most productive farmland in their universe. So something's gone wrong. Now part of it might be natural climate change, part of it's probably what we've done. If we fast forward to our own area, um, if we were to go to the Peak District and look, you know, walk across Big Moor or the Eastern Moors, you'll find a lot of evidence of prehistoric settlements, Bronze Age rings, burial mounds, Iron Age features, uh, very populated landscape. If you look at the pollen grains in Ringing Low Bog, it will tell you about the changing vegetation. And essentially, what happened in the Peak Districts and the Pennines was that early settlers cleared the woods, the trees were smaller, more sparse, kind of wood pasture landscape, and it was relatively easy to to clear. You wouldn't settle in Sheffield because it was a very well wooded and very wet landscape with big trees. So you, the early settlement is actually upon the, the Peak District where people now think it's wild, which it isn't. Um, but one of the consequences, particularly the, the Iron Age and Romano British population, was that they were ploughing land and growing crops. And that lasted a very short time and basically all the topsoil was washed off. The soils acidified, various processes kicked in, which uh, caused in some places like Wingy Low Bog to get a, a ponding up in the water and you end up with a stagnant bog. And in other cases, you just got massive erosion of the soil, which ends up in the river terraces of so places like the Trent, the Humber, the Don, the Air, Calder, etc., etc. You can actually see the sediments there that are washed off in the So that's two or three, four thousand years ago, we don't seem to learn very quickly about what we're doing to the soils. Um, so things happen there. One is that you've degraded the landscape. Look, okay, we've now got a national park, which is brilliant and fantastic, and the ecology is wonderful, as in the heritage, but as a productive landscape, it's pretty well shot. Soils are washed off, um, dumped in the terraces. If you go down to East Anglia, you'll see the wash, and you can look at the wash over a long period of time, you can see the sediments encroaching uh, out towards the North Sea. That's all the soil from Middle England. And of course, a lot of it ends up in the North Sea causing pollution. That's not terribly good either. Um, if you were to go closer to home, we, we did a conference called Rewilding the Soil about was it two years ago, three years ago. Um, I went out to do some prelims and some little video clips which were on my blog and my Twitter. Um, and I took photographs and I also did a film of what's happening in the Moss Valley, where I kind of cut my teeth as a trespassing young urchin, being chased by gamekeepers and farmers most of the time. And since the 1970s, they've been ploughing down the hill. And all the soil washes off. And they've been ploughing down the hill and they've been ploughing the floodplain, which the terraces, which were unploughed in the 1960s. And I thought, it's all have changed. No, you go back there and they're still ploughing straight down the hill, the soil is still washing off into a protected triple SI 
straight. And the soil itself, and we look not just there, but we also went over to Nottinghamshire, got soils around Clumber and places like that. And you look in the soil and it's just a dead medium, there's nothing there. It's a growing medium with nothing in it. There's no fungi, there's no microarthropods, which make the thing happen, there's no earthworms. There's not even any slugs. There's nothing. It's a dead, inert substance onto which you add water if you haven't got a drought and into which you put things like fertiliser and herbicide and pesticide. And then we wonder why we've got <coughs> problems. There's no organic material in any of these soils. And, and when, when there is a drought, the ones in the Moss Valley, they, they just set like concrete. And you can see the fields where when you get a dry period, there's bare patches. There's nothing there. And yet if I'm a farmer, you know, I work with farmers, I talk to farmers, they know about soils and they know that the soil is their future. And it's their, if it's a family farm, it's the family's future. But they would say that they've been pushed into a situation in which um, they have to deliver high quantities, low costs, with lots and lots of what I call petrochemical subsidies, energy, fertiliser, lime, and herbicides, etc. Now, actually, with the way that petrochemical prices have gone, that's no longer viable. And some of the presentations at our conference, which were really positive about regenerative farming, and actually having less input, less output, but more profit, and it's sustainable. So these are things that we need to think about. So that's the bigger picture of composting, and you need to be aware of that, and aware of what we are doing to soils big time, because the soil in your back garden, the soil in the park, etc., is the mainstay of the, the biodiversity in the ecosystem. The other thing which is relevant to the idea of a response to climate change is that all of us in this room have partaken in this and it's unforgivable that we use peat. And if you don't believe me that it's pretty bad, look for an ITN documentary that I was involved in called Trouble with Garden Centres. And there is a link on my blog if you can't find it. Half it was to do with plastic, half it was to do with peat. And the bit on peat, we've got footage from Ireland of peat cutting and harvesting for horticulture and we think as a consequence the Irish government banned the export of horticultural peas. What the producers thought, giving access to the film crew to go on their site and show it, I do not know because it really is absolutely horrific. So one thing is that we should not use peas in any form. We have conservation organisations that are planting trees to sequestrate carbon and the trees are being grown in peas. Well, you've just drained the peat bog and you've released all the carbon from the peat that we've got here, but actually it's much worse because the peat bog itself will now dry up and will be hemorrhaging carbon. So you actually end up with a net carbon loss. You know, it's losing to the atmosphere. So it's just absolutely crazy. It's very hard if you shop at a garden centre not to use peat because lots of the pot plants and little plant that's are grown in peat. We're trying to work to get the industry to stop doing this. Um, the peat is brought all the way from the Baltic mainly. Some come from Scotland and stuff. What? Mostly from the Baltic states. You peat? Yeah. No. They ship all the way in to Hatfield in Doncaster and process it. It's absolutely horrific. So, it's very hard, you know, you get what I call disguised use of peat. We, you know, you can now go into garden centre and you can buy peat free compost, which is great, and it's now sensibly priced, which you go. Because you used to go to go in and you get a little bag of peat free compost for £10.50, or you could buy three huge bales of island for £3.50. So, what does your public get? And the other thing is the labelling, which is what I've got about in this documentary. It says natural product, organic. Biological. Yeah, there's all these weasel words, and then you find someone says 70% peat. Oh, it's low peat, 70%. Hmm, I'm not sure that's. So, one of the answers, sorry, I'm preaching here, but I'm very upset about this. One of the answers is composting. And composting is great, it's really fulfilling. I, in my garden at home, and hopefully, some of you read my magazine articles and things about my garden and wildlife gardening. 
I don't throw anything away. Everything is reused and recycled and any organic matter that I produce during the year or come the autumn winter is composted and recycled back into the soil. And that helps to climate proof your garden. It's not just you know the carbon issues and things like that. It's that you're putting organic matter back into the soil. That will hold back water when it's a time of flood, which even though I'm at the top of the hill we have had floods. We're in a bizarre situation where we have spring lines. And a few years ago we suddenly had a river coming down the back garden, which was just very strange. You expect to get flooded at the bottom of it, you don't expect to get flooded at the top of the hill. <laughs> um, but if you've got organic matter in your garden, in the soil, that will help mop up and hold back water. But it also holds water and nutrients in the soil, which will be useful uh, during dry periods as well. And we are getting, with climate change, we're getting the boom and bust, we're getting uh, very wet periods and very long dry periods like we had last year. So you need to build up that uh, organic matter and the best way is composting. And there are some dark arts, some magic arts of composting, which I'm sure Andy will share with us. Yeah. But it's a really fulfilling, uh, satisfying thing to do. When you get that really nice, pliable compost at the end of two or three years of process, it's pretty damn good. And on that happy note, I'll hand over to Andy. Thank you. Uh... Right. Good. There we are. Good. Okay. Uh, my name's Andy, um, and I've come to talk to you today about what we do uh, in respect of uh, coppices. Uh, coppice. That's one of my other talks. <laughs> Composting. Um, firstly, just following on from what. Ian said, um, the, I don't, I, I assume most of you have seen the, 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 the news lately, um, and there's been a lot of talk in the news about um, the water authorities and dumping sewerage into our rivers, as most of you have probably picked up on, and, and it's quite interesting, I, I saw uh, a headline the other day uh, and it said um, the water rates will have to go up to pay for stopping all of the raw sewage going into our rivers and, and you know I, I really that really hit me as a headline and I thought well hang on a minute surely they should be a they should be doing that anyway you know it's part of their job uh, you know, don't put poo in the rivers, it's like fairly fundamental on the dog job description, isn't it? Uh, and, and yet they're doing it and they're saying we're, we as people are going to have to pay more money so they can stop that problem. Uh, and, and as Ian said, you know, everything in his garden and my garden is re recycled. Um, in our forest garden, uh, we've got a compost toilet. Uh, which is very nice, it's a wooden shed basically with a loo and a, a long drop pit. Um, I, I do some work with an organisation called Radical Bakers and they, they, they have a, a gathering, two gatherings, uh, summer and autumn, uh, 200 people, totally compost toilets. Um, so all the waste goes back into the soil. <coughs> Okay, and I think, you know, to start my talk, fundamentally, uh, as a race, we have such a problem with human waste. You know, it, it, it's dirty, it's smelly, it, it, it's oh, loads of things. We don't like it. Uh, and it, it's very much in, in modern day culture that, um, we just get rid of everything. You get the loom, you flush it, it's gone. You put stuff in your recycling bin or your black bin for the landfill or your compost bin and then the men come round on a Wednesday or a Thursday, whenever, and they take it all away and it's gone. Uh, and, and I think so many valuable resources 
just in our lives we say, right, get rid of that, it's gone. It's not our problem, it's somebody else's. Um, and, and yeah, I just wanted to, to sort of bring that to the, to, to the, the forefront, really, um, because the way, the way we live our lives at, at, at home, my family, is, you know, we're, we're really conscious of waste and getting rid of waste and what we do. Uh, and and I, I, I find it so annoying, uh, it does make me quite cross. I won't get cross this afternoon, but it does make me cross about the way that people nowadays deal with waste. You know, everything from McDonald's wrappers out the car window to what you actually put in your bins. Uh, uh, and, and I think that that culture of, you know, a way, I mean, there is no way, you know, it, it doesn't exist. It all ends up somewhere. Um, so yeah, anyway, I've got that off my chest. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll start on my talk. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be um, very scientific at all this afternoon. I, I'm not going to talk about the chemistry of composting. Um, I'm just going to talk about what we, we do and how we do it. Okay. Um, that obviously is a view of a compost bin. Uh, in our garden, um, it's, it's in fact probably quite a good quick snapshot of our diet. We're all vegetarian in our house, so yeah. Uh, but anyway, right. So you will be talking about the pH something. Um, so I will, I will a little bit. A little bit. Okay. Yeah, but but not in in any great sort of just the one question. Um, but yeah, I, I'll take questions later on. Later on. Um, I, I'm, 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 I'm just sort of more interested in getting what we actually physically do on the ground. Okay. Over to you guys. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we live in Derbyshire. Um, we're a family of four, uh, plus chickens and sheep. Um, we. Uh, I, I don't know, our, our lifestyle is quite unusual to a lot of people, I think, um, in, in the sense that uh, we, we do quite a few different things. Uh, we don't do normal things uh, that most people perhaps do in their lives. For example, uh, we haven't got television, uh, don't miss it, it's great. Um, um, and we, we, we yeah, we just tend to do things in our life that may be a bit different. So, we do a lot of traditional crafts. Um, Beth, my other half, she um, makes wool rugs and does mountain. We've got 17 sheep, which we keep for wool. Um, um, and craft work. I, I do a lot of green woodworking. Um, and I'm involved uh, quite a lot in the, the sort of Greenwood culture. Uh, I, I organise the Bodgers Ball and uh, various other things during the year. So yeah, we're, we're quite into our crafts. Uh, we grow willow. Uh, in fact, this winter we've just planted up new willow beds and I'll, I'll talk about willow a bit more in a bit because uh, we do use them in, a, in our growing uh, system. Um, yeah, we try, I mean, you've all read that now. Um, we try to lead a sustainable, low-impact life. Um, we, I, I, the other thing that I get very annoyed about is the the modern culture of Amazon and uh, deliveries. And my my next door neighbours are very into car culture. You know that. Clean their cars every other day, which I find bizarre. Um, and you know, there's parcels being delivered all the time, and, and I, 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 both me and Bev uh, find that quite a strange way to live, to be honest. And we'd rather try and have as little impact on the environment and the world as we can. 
mm -hmm. by using our lives. You could use the Amazon. Sorry, you could use the Amazon cardboard for the for the compost. I suppose. Sorry, I could. You could use the Amazon the cardboard for the compost. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah we we cardboard. Yeah, I'll get on to cardboard in a minute. We, oh, we yeah. use an awful lot. I get excited about cardboard. <laughs> cardboard does not make me angry. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I, the big thing for us that I want to get across is we didn't want to be reliant on outside agencies to live our lives. Uh, I, I've just reached the dizzy heights of being 60. And I'm like, well, actually, I don't need all this stuff. I don't, at 60 years old, I should be able to look after myself. I, I don't need to be reliant on gas from Russia or wherever. I'm most of us, about 5%, I think, comes from Norway. I, I don't want to be reliant on that system. I don't want to be reliant on the electricity board to provide me power and stuff like that. And this is something that over the past sort of 30 years has pretty much dominated my life. But anyway, right. Okay, we're not self-sufficient. We don't want to be. It's blooming hard work. Uh, just, just try it one day. Try and be self-sufficient. It, it's near impossible. I, I was brought up with the culture of uh, John Seymour and people like that, and I, I bought all his books and, oh, great, if I had four acres and a cow, I'd be happy. But, you know, I try, we try and do what we do. But as I said, we just want to be less reliant on the system. Uh, and that's where composting really comes into it. Okay, so a little bit more about us, and then I will talk about composting. Um, that's the back of our house. Um, we've got 18 solar PV panels on the roof, uh, which provide the bulk of our electricity. Um, I also uh, sell electricity back to the National Grid. Obviously, they pay me less for it than they're, they're willing to sell it to me for, because uh, uh, they're, they're a business. Um, don't let me get started on that one. Um, we've got solar thermal panels for our hot water. Um, they're big glass tubes with a copper core up the middle. Uh, and there's, how many of those is there? About 18, I think. Um, and so in summer, uh, we have endless supplies of hot water. I can actually go to my kitchen sink in June or July put a tea bag in a cup, open the hot tap and have a cup of tea, it's that hot. Um, in the winter we rely on wood burning uh, and the wood burning of course uh, provides us with uh, wood ash which I'll talk about in a bit, um, it does go into our composting system but not in huge amounts. So we rely on wood burners to heat the house uh, and, and also run the radiators, hot water. Uh, and the only gas that we use in our house is to cook on, because we like cooking on a flame. I can't get on with electric cooking, unfortunately. I, I, it, yeah, I don't get it, don't work with me. So, yeah, um, there's us. We're, 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 that's where we are in life. Right, here, here's a couple of statistics. The UK bins 9.5 million tonnes of food waste every year, 70% of which comes from houses. My next door neighbours, they're lovely, they're, they're nice people, I do like them, but it's quite interesting. Bin day is Thursday, right? Thursday morning, bins go out. And my neighbour, when it's black bin day, that, that's landfill. Yeah, my neighbour Gay, she comes out with bags of stuff, all food, puts it in the black bin, Thursday, gone. Friday, she goes to Morrison's. <laughs> uh, I, 
You, you've guessed, haven't you? She comes back with bags of shopping. And I think, right, that will be going in the black bin, going into the landfill. Um, you know, uh, we did actually ask them at one point, could, could, could we have all your food waste? It's like we've got chickens and compost bins. And, uh, they went, yeah. And then I was in the yard a few weeks later and I heard them having a discussion. And one of them said to the other one, said, Don't give the food waste to next door, it looks bad. <laughs> oh, right, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, average UK family wastes eight meals a week. In the bit gone, and all of that. I mean, that, 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 there's that, that's a meal in our house, okay? Uh, a lovely quiche, veg out the garden, uh, eggs out the garden, and, and that's what we're throwing out. I, I've tamed all my neighbours because my neighbours love pristine lawns, you know, stripes up and down. Excellent, you know, everything. And about a quarter of an inch of its life. And, and so, usually every other week, they produce a dustbin bag full of grass clippings, which will go in the black bin to landfill, of course. Um, not that the black bin, uh, bin bag will degrade, of course. But I put it in with the compost, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. Okay, so how do we grow food? Uh, at our place. Well, um, Charles Dowling, some of you, yeah, the lady there, a couple of people are nodding, they know it. I think he's brilliant. Um, and I, I, you know, I've got quite a few of his books. Uh, I watch his videos uh, on the, the laptop and things like that. And, and it, it, it did change my way of looking at things quite a lot. As Ian said about ploughing in the Moss Valley, you know, everything running down the hill into the water well, of course, all your soil's gone. Raised beds, excellent idea. Um, the way that we make raised beds, just very quickly, uh, as a prime example, we had a few houses down. The owners live in Aditha, the house is empty. The, the garden was as high as those doors with brambles and we said uh, look can we uh, if we get it all down can we grow on it um, and they said yes fine so so we we, we, we we were growing veg on that that back garden for two three years um, and all we did was cover everything with cardboard and then built raised beds on mm -hmm. and minimal amount of weeding Everything in the raised beds was compost produced by us. Um, and yeah, weeding was so easy. As they came through, we just pulled them out. They were weakened by the cardboard, etc. So I'm, I'm, you know, why, why dig? Why double? You look at older gardening books, and, you know, double dig. Why do that? The worms are going to do it for you. Let them do that job so you don't have to. Um, we have a, a lot of mixed planting. <coughs> um, I was trying to find a, a photograph to, to show our mixed planting. I couldn't find one, so I, I did that one. That's actually in our back garden. Uh, and I, I like mixing my plants up. I don't go for straight rows. I can't see the point of having a row of this, a row of that. I mix everything up. I do companion planting as well. Um, and a lot of stuff that we grow, we grow a lot of perennials uh, and a lot of annuals that we use that cut and come again. So we're actually cutting off the leaves, letting them grow again. Taking, and I get three or four harvests a year or one plant now. So uh, we've, we've also got a forest garden. Um, and the forest garden, the way that works uh, is, is basically woodland structure. So you've, you've got a canopy layer of, of uh, hazel 
uh, and apple trees, and then underneath that you've got your, your plant layers, etc., down to your, your ground layer. Um, we grow a lot of perennial stuff in there, um, and, and we do have a few raised beds as well, growing some some veg in there, but most of the veg is done in the veg gardens. Hydroponics, uh, I, I got into hydroponics a few years ago, and I, I really do quite like it. Um, when, when, when I wrote that slide, I, I, I undenied whether to put it in, um, because I thought, well, I'm talking about composting, and, and then hydroponics is, of course, growing in, in no soil at all. Um, but just briefly, the reason we, we do hydroponics is because over the winter in, in the greenhouse, I can grow salad crops in the warmth in there with no soil, just by um, rainwater. We're, we're big on rainwater harvesting. Uh, how many gallons do I hold? 400 and something gallons worth of rainwater already for this point. The Jane Hardy in North East Arbyshire, I can assure you. <laughs> Mind you, you're all from Shep, so you know that. <laughs> um, and the, the, the only food that I use for the plants, the only nutrients is, and I'll talk about this later, is uh, comfrey water and nettle water. So all the nettles and comfrey, we, we put those in a bin, let them rot down and we take the, the liquid out of the bottom. Uh, and that's what we feed our salad crops and the hydroponics over the winter. And lastly, home composting, which is what I'm here to talk about, so I'm going to talk about it now. Right, okay. Um, most of you are familiar with composting cones. Um, they're great for small spaces. Um, I, I'm quite obsessive about them. <laughs> it was quite interesting after lockdown finished. Lockdown were brilliant, weren't they? <coughs> after lockdown, everybody was so bored during lockdown. Ah, oh, we're going to compost. Ah, oh, we're going to burn wood. And then after lockdown, you could buy wood burners for like 20 quid. Everybody was getting rid of their compost bins because after two years they couldn't be bothered. And they were great. Um, yeah, it was really interesting watching how communities changed. And, but uh, yeah, it's great. Um, from my experience, uh, most compost bins that you, you, you can buy um, are black, which, which, yeah, it's got its obvious reasons for having black. But um, this chap here, this green one, produces compost a lot quicker than the black ones. I haven't quite sussed out why. Um, I was talking to my son about this the other night. Uh, this is what we talk about if we haven't got television music. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he said, well, that one's actually shorter and squatter. Uh, and that's the only reasoning we can get why that produces better compost than the tall black ones. And yeah, he may well be right. Um, the, the black plastic would radiate heat out at the night time. Yeah, it will. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, that's true. Um, but that green one, that, that's my favourite. Um, and as you can see here, this, this, this is stuck on one of our compost bins. Uh, it, it, it's actually a sap adhesive um, uh, temperature gauge. Um, it's used for wine making. You stick it on your wine barrel so you can measure the temperature of your, your wine. Um, and as you, uh, I don't know if you can pick it up from where you are, but uh, that's sitting at 24 degrees uh, Celsius at the, the time I took that photo, which I think was uh, mid spring. Uh, yeah, it was mid spring, so it was sat at 24 degrees. <coughs> okay, so they're great for small spaces, uh, they do take longer. You look in a year or two. If you're going to buy one of those, don't buy two, get two compost bins. 
Um, some of them have a little door that you can pull out down the bottom, as I'm sure you know. Others don't, and you just have to lift them up. Uh, and what I do, um, well, what I would do if I was only composted using two bins is I would start off filling one bin, uh, and when that was full, uh, I would lift it off. Uh, and take all of the good compost, which would be down the bottom here, take that away and use it, and all the stuff in the top, I would put into the second bin that I'm filling up, okay? Um, if you only have one, it's what you do, you, you're constantly juggling compost and, and vegetation that's turning into compost, okay? And <coughs> If you're using those, which I'm, I'm sure some of you have got them, and I use them as well, um, obviously you want alternate layers, uh, greens and browns. Greens being like lawn trimmings, browns being woody stuff, or in our case, uh, cardboard. Okay, But you don't want the layers very thick, because otherwise it will start getting damp and rotting and, and won't. Uh, compost as readily. Okay. Sorry, no questions, but what's very thick and what's very thin? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, good question. Um, in our black ones, uh, here in the, in the Daleks, as I call them, uh, I'm looking at a two or three inch layer max. Okay. Yeah, and then, you know, if that was greens, then browns on top. Yeah. And thickness of browns? Sorry? The thickness of oh, about the same. About the same. Two to three inch layers. Good question. Yeah. Um, that's what we do. And that, um, one thing with... Uh, 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 this isn't all cardboard coming out of my house. I mean, it says Amazon on that one, look. Uh, but cardboard's amazing. <laughs> and, and what I've learned over the years, I mean, this is probably... A, 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 Pretty good tip actually. Um, the recycling day after Easter Bank Holiday weekend. If you want cardboard, get yourself down on the street. Because Easter weekend, everybody has bought a new patio table and chairs, a new barbecue for the summer, uh, loads of other stuff. And it all comes in really big cardboard boxes. And you go out on Thursday or whenever your recycling day is after Easter. Uh, remember, it's a bank holiday, it might be a day late. But everybody will have their bin and then a stash of cardboard. And we take a lot. And what we do is we shred this up, just rip it up and, and straight into the compost. Uh, and as I said, in some of our bins, um, are just uh, compost bins are purely cardboard and manure. And the mushrooms that grow in there, and the quality of the soil after a while is, is brilliant. Um, years ago, I went to the Centre for Alternative uh, Technology in North Wales, and I assume they've still got it or something similar, but they had displays of compost, there was shoe manure uh, from human waste, there was stuff from cardboard and, and you know you could put your hands in and peel it and tear them and it was really quite interesting. Um, so you don't have to worry about the inks and all that in the... No, uh, do you know that's something else that we've had long debates about in our house uh, and most of the inks now are water based. The water based. Yeah, um, and so we, 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 yeah, we don't find it as a huge problem. Uh, there, there's been quite a lot with printed and stuff to get sure. rid of the nasty chemicals, you know. Mm -hmm. in, in, in fact, my granddad, he was a printer and it, it was a mania that printed that finished him off in the end. Finished him off? Yeah, um, but nowadays, you know, printing's a lot different <coughs> to what it was. So yeah, we don't see that as a problem. Yeah, cardboard. Can't get enough of the stuff. In terms of that mix then, the cardboard and manure. Yeah. If you if going back to the conversation earlier about peat-free compost, 
Yeah. So if you wanted to enhance your peat-free compost, if you were if you composted yourself um, cardboard and manure, and you added that into the peat-free compost, would that be rich enough as a sort of a growing medium? Ah, uh, yeah. Or would you just grow in the in the um, manure and the um, cardboard? Right, I, I mean, in answer to that, some of our bins are just purely manure and cardboard, yeah. and that works really well. Others are from garden waste, kitchen waste, blah, blah, blah. Um, when my bins are, 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 are ready, what I tend to do is, is mix them up. So I, I sorry, I might, might, might have misled you there slightly. It's just I've got a horse, so manure's not a problem. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I mean, I use it in a mix right. with, with other stuff. But, uh, as, I, as I said, you know, it, 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 you, you could grow in it. It's very rich. And how long does, would that take to actually break down sufficiently? Because I've used the manure before and put it in the garden and all you get is uh, mushrooms and things. You know, do, do, yeah, do, yeah. Perhaps because, as you say, it's such a strong growing mix. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to suit if it's it used in a concentrated form. Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah. We, we, as I said, we mix and match if right. you like. Okay. Um, it will be too strong for some plants. Right. Uh, I mean, other plants like you know, tomatoes. I pretty much grow on right. on this system. But then again, if, if you ever have a chance to have a, a wander around the sewage works. Oh. Um, just count the number of smart plants you see, yeah. and they're everywhere, you know. Um, so yeah, yeah, stuff like tomatoes, I'll, I'll grow straight in cardboard and manure, but other plants like the raised beds, it's all mixed in. Um, and how long would you need to leave it in the compost bin if it was cardboard and manure for it to uh, Right, um, depending on temperatures, if, if you're talking, if you're talking about garlic, Probably getting on for two years. Oh, a hot so bed. Long, long time. Year. Yeah. Um, the other thing I like about cardboard is like this sort of stuff here. It's full of all those air pockets. Yeah. Uh, and that, that provides air in your compost heap, which is good. Um, it also provides ways for the worms to get in uh, and other insects to get in um, and break it up. Um, so if I've got a big cardboard box, the first thing I do is I take all of the tape off of it and tape's mad at the minute, everybody tapes everything up. Um, most cellar tape is made out of cellulose so it, it should break down but I've had off bits of parcel tape gone into compost and they've been around for years, they don't break up. So we peel all that off and then we just rip them up. We just have a, a cardboard ripping morning. <laughs> Once again, it's because we haven't got a television, so we have to go something. <laughs> okay, yeah. Mycelium. This, this uh, is horse muck in a compost bin. You can see it's beginning to start to break down and mushrooms all over it. Uh, and their mycelium is going in the soil. That mycelium will go into your raised beds or your garden uh, and help improve the soil. Um, it's like I don't mind mushrooms being everywhere. I quite like them. I thought, you know, other people might see them as untidy. The right hand picture there once again is horse muck, the left hand picture, that is all wood chip, okay, and as you can see, that's just wood chip left in a huge pile, uh, and the, the mycelium, the mushrooms are, are, are just going mad. Okay, that's my son, uh, little connection with him, he 
is now in many of his mobile phones. Watching films and Yeah. Uh, that was in our forest garden. Um, as you can see, it's quite green and leafy. Uh, and uh, that's the big supply of wood chip. Um, most uh, tree surgeons have got so much of the stuff uh, that um, uh, they're quite glad to get rid of it. I get all asked for free. Uh, I either get it by a tractor and trailer load. There's the compost toilet in the background. Uh, or uh, from uh, Chris's uni mob. Now this is all green. This is fresh cut wood chip. Um, <laughs> that, that's our house there. That's actually been tipped in one of my neighbours' gardens, but they're the ones that we've been gardening. So for a while we were using their front garden as a, a sort of a drop-off point for wood chip. Um, the way our raised beds that we grow in, uh, I, there's a lot of debate about whether you should have sides or not have sides on your way raised bed. Some people put sides on to hold it all in. Then when the compost has formed a structure, they take the sides off, say in about slugs. I don't have a big slug problem. What I do do, if I'm putting a, a raised bed up, um, all I'll do is cover the entire area with three or four layers of cardboard. I'll keep the cardboard a foot out from the sides of the raised beds, okay, uh, and then I cover that with wood chip and, you know, pathways around the raised beds. And that system works really well, so uh, there's a lot of wood chip going into that front garden, um, but I can use it, I'm always running out. Uh, it goes into compost, it goes, uh, I make all my parts with it, over the cardboard as I said, uh, and yeah, generally, once you get a waste product that, that, that we can use. Oh, worms. I do like worms. Uh, as I said earlier, um, why dig your garden when uh, worms are doing it for you for free? No labour at all. And they will. Um, this is in the bottom of that green compost bin I showed you earlier, actually. Um, and if you're really into your, your worms, get the, the age uh, key to worms. We've got two main types in this country that you'll see. Yeah, basically. One, one is uh, uh, the, the, the common earthworm, and the other one is the brandling or tiger worm. Yeah. Now, you can actually pay a lot of money and buy it. Uh, tiger worms or brandling worms in, you, you can buy them. I assume they come in a cardboard box, <laughs> um, which would be useful. Um, but I find that I, I get them coming into to my compost naturally. I've never had to buy any in. Um, and, and they are much better. They work at a far greater range of temperatures and they'll much just about everything. So, so they uh, the red worm, this one. Sorry? It's called the red worm. Red worm. Yeah, I, 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 I've always known them as brandling or tiger worms because of the way you see the stripes from nature. Yeah. The one on the left there. Yeah. Uh, now, nah, that, that's what I call worms. I mean, I'm not worm farming, but that is just a handful of compost picked up with the worms in it, which uh, is amazing, isn't it? it you want to try and guess how many is there so you can win a prize, you know. Uh, isn't that amazing? Um, and that, that, that's just naturally occurred. They've just come in. Right, chickens. Yeah, I keep uh, a few chickens. Um, when I'm growing, chickens are my friend. They, they provide me with chicken butt, uh, which I use sparingly in the compost. Um, I, I, I don't use, you know, I don't put vast amounts in, but what we tend to do in that they've got a fence yard 
uh, um, in which they live, and every now and again, um, we'll muck that out, um, muck the, the chicken hutch out, uh, and that soil is then spread around the, or I say soil, the, the, the output is then spread around the compost bins, you know, reasonably equally, a couple of shovelfuls in each, and, and that's bringing in bacteria and, and various other stuff which helps with the compost process. Also, in the winter, they're allowed free range of the veg garden, uh, and they do a wonderful job just kicking around. And that's the only digging I do, really. I leave it up to the worms. Um, the, the picture in the middle is um, uh, sorrel, um, and what I do is uh, I grow quite a lot of sorrel and um, uh, other, you know, beets, leafy plants, and I let some every year go to seed, um, and then I harvest them. They they stay in the ground over winter basically, and they seed in the next spring. Um, and uh, chard I use to do this, so like that. that's chard there. Um, and then I pull the whole plant out, and then this is fed to the chickens. Um, come free. Right. Yeah, it comes up all the time, my very. Oh, it's lovely stuff. It's wild. So. I know. Uh, you, you, we grow a lot of it, and you have to stay on top of it. What should I do with that? Right, I will show you in the next slide. What I do, the reason I grow comfrey, okay, is I put it in this machine. I know, the machine's a bit of a extravagant. Um, yeah. This plastic dustbin, yeah. raised on bricks, it's got a hole drilled in the bottom, and um, I did mean to bring some. Um, you wouldn't have thanked me for it, but we fill the bin with uh, comfrey leaves and then we just leave it to rot down. We keep filling it up, mm -hmm. which as you said isn't difficult if you've got comfrey. Is this coming uh, everywhere? Oh, I know. It, 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 you plant one here and it, it, yeah, it'll be all over. <coughs> and that comfrey tea oh, it's good stuff. is so strong. Mm. If I'd have bought some and passed it around, you wouldn't have found me um, at all. Um, yeah, it really, really does reek. Uh, put it this way, we water it down by a ratio of 1 to 10. Okay, so it's 10 parts water to 1 part that. Um, we also put nettles in there, stinging nettles. Uh, and that is our all-round feed. Um, that's what we, we, we water the tomatoes mm -hmm. with and everything else. Um, what I've got, um, as I've said, once all that's strained, I, I've then got a five gallon uh, wine making barrel with a tap on the bottom and we dilute it in those and then they just sit there uh, and obviously you can pour it off at the bottom. Um, but that is our main feed in the garden. We, we don't use any uh, bought, you know, feed. I know if I said that. Um, the other one we use is, well, we grow a lot of willow. Um, and slightly off the subject of composting in a way, but um, these willows here, they're in a nursery bed. Um, in fact, they were planted out in November into a new willow bed on the farm. Um, but uh, yeah, I, what I've done there with those is I put them in, into a big trough. Um, so I ended up, you, you can't plant willow, of course, just by poking the rod in the ground and not going to go, you probably know. But I, I prefer to put them in there, get them to root, and then plant them out as rooted trees. And what that actually means is that I can take a crop off of them a year earlier than if they were just sticks, because the sticks would spend the first year putting their roots out 
second year putting out foliage. Uh, whereas if they're rooted, they don't have to do that. They, they can just go straight into upwards growth. But the reason I put that slide in is the the bucket here um, is full of willow offcuts. Um, and we use that a, a lot when we are um, taking cuttings and we use it as a, as a routine compound. Mm. Okay, so that's just willow soaked in water, making another tea. So I've got the comfrey and nettle tea and I've also got willow tea, which, yeah, as well as I use mainly. And if I've got spare, you know, just goes into water. Christy, have, have, I, got five have I got five minutes? Okay. Um, right, okay. This, I, I, I did a little, this structure, this is our compost. As you can see, there's this biggish twiggy bits here. I've cleaned this down, I, I've dug it out. That's actually in a raised bed that we're growing in. That's the cardboard underneath, still pretty much intact. Um, uh, and it just gives you a bit of an idea on this side of what our compost looks like. Don't expect it to be fine and small. And you're going to get bits in it. You're going to have big bits, medium, little bits. That's fine. Dig a hole anywhere and look at the soil structure. It's not that uniform. So, yeah, if you're making compost, don't worry if it doesn't look like John Innes number six or whatever. Okay. Once again, structure. Here's more horse poo. Uh, you can see the worms working. And uh, I'll show you these later on. We'll pass them around. But, uh, look at that. Um, that one there, that's... I'll pass this one around actually while I'm talking. That is pure cardboard and horse muck compost when it's finished, ready to go on the soil. Okay, so that's basically, the structure will change from that to that. It looks good enough to eat. It does. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome to try. <laughs> uh, okay, this shows, this is, I've lifted a um, Darling Conot, okay? Uh, and, and so there's across that, you can see the layers in there. Um, and 51.4 degrees C. Uh, that's, yeah, that's hotter than my house ever is. <laughs> um, but how, yeah. how old is that? Um, that? That would have been, all you've got to worry about is getting your structure right, your layers. You know, you want greens and then you want browns. And as long as you're achieving that, um, you should be okay. Right, cornstarch. I did a little experiment. Um, I, 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 I get two journals four times a year. One's British Wildlife Magazine. Not the BBC Wildlife Magazine, may I add. Um, but the, the, the British Wildlife and also uh, the Bodgers Gazette. And both of them uh, come in cornstarch wrappers. Okay, and I thought, right, I'll do an experiment. I, I like having experiments. And in fact, there's a handout that Christine's kindly put online that you can look at that talks about some of my other experiments. Um, but I, I got my cornstarch wrapper, there it is. Uh, I believe that one was from the Bodgers Gazette. And I put it in a compost bin and six months later I had a dig around and I found it. It wasn't difficult. But that, that was six months with cornstarch in a bit. So they do biodegrade, but it does take quite a while. Um, 
but yeah, that, that was six months in, in a hot bit. Uh, it's still there, it, it's in a totally different format to when it started. And thanks for listening. <laughs> Thank you.